Shalom and welcome to Temple Talk. This is Yitzhak Ruben speaking to you from Jerusalem. Despite the lockdown, I made it to Jerusalem today, today to record Temple Talk for you. Today is the 25th day of the month of Tishrei 5781, the 13th of October 2020. We have just concluded our 22-day uh, New Year preparation, spiritual preparation month. Uh, getting ready for the new year begins on Rosh Hashanah and that preparation continues all the way through Shmini Atzeret slash Simchat Torah which is 22 days later which was last Sunday uh, I'm sorry last Shabbat here in Israel last Shabbat it was the final day of this 22 day preparation course and we should all be feeling ready to go uh, step into a new year brand new people um, worked on ourselves we already began working on ourselves in earnest already a month before Rosh Hashanah during Elul and hopefully after all that we've changed for the better and hopefully as we've changed ourselves for the better we will be able to um, change the world for the better this new year of 5781 and of course we're beginning the new year where we left off we're beginning our Torah reading of the new year where we left off on Simchat Torah last Shabbat, which was with the beginning of the beginning, the beginning of the book of Genesis, the beginning, beginning of the first reading of Genesis, known in English as Genesis, in Hebrew as Breshit, in the beginning. And we're going to pick up right there, and that's going to read it in Hebrew, that first amazing verse of the Torah, Breshit bara Elokim, et hashamayim et haaretz. In the beginning, it's usually translated as, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now I'm looking here at a stone edition uh, art scroll translation, and they make a slight different translation. In the beginning of God's creating the heavens and the earth. Okay? They're very keen to make this slight change. And whereas, I don't know that one... Um, translation is more accurate than the other. Uh, the point that I think that slight change is trying to make is that there really is no accurate translation. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It, seem, it's, it's, it seems pretty clear. However, nothing is that clear. The original Hebrew, Bereshit, uh, if it were to mean exactly precisely in the beginning, uh, I think the proper way of saying that would be uh, Barishon, uh, at the start of it all, in the beginning, Bereshit is a certain grammatical construct which implies at the beginning of something, or not told what, at the beginning of something. For example, there, there's a Hebrew expression, uh, Bereshit Chokma Yir Atashem. The beginning of wisdom is the fear of Shem. Bereshit chokma, beginning of wisdom. Here we have Bereshit barai Elokim at It's in the beginning of, in the beginning of, God created the heavens and the earth. So immediately we're thrown off. Uh, and we should be thrown off. But wh what's the beginning? In the beginning of God's creating, actually, it's a pretty good translation, the beginning of God's creating. Because before creation, there was no beginning. There was no time. There was no... Uh, there was no calibration of 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 uh, some kind of timeline. It just didn't exist. Part of that creation, a you know, fundamental part of creation, is time, and the other fundamental part of creation is space. And of course, the other fundamental part of creation is the God creation continuum, the God relating to creation, ultimately. Uh, in its highest form, the God-man relationship. That is the third, and as far as the Torah is concerned, really that is the third and most uh, important aspect of creation. In fact, astonishingly enough, uh, all of creation is described in six days. Six days. And it wasn't merely a physical creation that's going on here, and it's very clear each day, with one exception, each day, God creates by saying, by speaking. Okay, I'm going to read now in the Hebrew, the second verse. 
וארץ הייתה תוהו ובוהו, וחושך על פני תהום, ורוח אלוקים מרחפת על פני המים. Again, another inexplicable verse. Uh, the earth, again, this translation says, when the earth was astonishingly empty. That's their description of tohu vavohu, which often I think is, is, you know, chaos and void. I think it's often translated as. Again, tohu and vohu, they've never appeared before. Here, the sec second verse, they are what they are. We don't know exactly. And we can delve into it and try to understand. But obviously, there was a distinction between tohu and vohu. Otherwise, there would have only been one thing described. We don't know. Is it a yin-yang? One is apparently the opposite uh, in some aspect of the other. There, there's, a, there's a distinction between them. In fact, the process of creation, as, as described throughout these six days, is one of dividing, distinguishing between things that were, that were previously undistinguishable because they were part of a unity, part of a unity that was God, and now God is separating them out, and then he separates things out and then puts things together. Because God is not creating out of a, uh, 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 you know, a box of, of Legos. Whatever God creates must come somehow from somewhere within God himself, because there's nothing beyond God. This is one of the, one of the mysteries of creation and one of the things that that the Kabbalah mysticism uh, delves into and discusses. Uh, but one thing that's very clear, God calls things into, into he speaks things into being. Uh, you know, God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good. God separated between the light and the darkness, and God called, called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. So God speaks something into being. God sees that it's good. And then God defines it by calling it something. This is the basic process of creation that is repeated throughout the six days. But when God sees that it's good, it means that it's not simply a a, you know, a created physical being. It's a being that is charged with something called good. And good is a positive. So God is creating a world that is, that is radiated with his goodness. And when the Kabbalists, when our, when our sages ask, why, you know, the only question here is why did God create? Bereshit, Genesis, tells us how God created. But the question is why? And the answer is to, is to spread that goodness. God, was, God is good, and God wants to bestow goodness on something. So God creates creation in order to bestow goodness upon creation. That is, in a nutshell, God's motivation for creation, to fill that creation with goodness, with a positive spiritual uh, essence, energy. And that is really what all of creation is about. Again, the first six days, we learn all sorts of details about creation. And, you know, when, to this day, when you, when you, uh, do a, a comparison between creation as described here in the first verses of Genesis and all that science has discovered, you know, over the past hundreds of years. Um, the account in, in Bereshit, in, in, in Genesis, uh, pretty much says it all. But it says even more than all, because science, you know, is, is, the, is the study of really the study of the obvious. It's the study of what can be discovered. It's the study of what can be defined by us, man, what we can comprehend. You know, we can put our finger on and point to. And what we call, we don't call it good in science, we call it fact. So again, it's very beautiful thing 
that the account of, of creation in Bereshit um, basically stands second to none in terms of if you want to compare it to other scientific concepts of how the world came into being and things like evolution and all those things. But science doesn't understand goodness. It doesn't understand that energy. It doesn't understand mankind. It doesn't understand what makes us unique. Yes, we're a bunch of chemicals with some, with some, with some uh, electricity which shoots through our body. And it's all for the purpose of survival of the fittest and procreation. And basically, the basic definition of mankind by creation, of, 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 of all of creation by creation, is that it's, it's, you know, been created just to sustain itself. There's no explanation for what makes me different from you, what makes music compelling, why someone can, can compose a beautiful symphony or song and someone else can find it so beautiful, bring them to tears. You know, why is a flower beautiful? Why is a sunset beautiful? You know, why do some things make us happy, make us laugh? It, it, they, can, they can try to boil it down to chemicals and electronic charges and things, but that, that, doesn't, have, that doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't describe anything about God's creation. The book of Genesis, these first chapters, and the entire Torah actually, sets out to teach us the beauty of creation and what makes us unique and what makes us essential elements, essential unique elements in creation. So we're going through the first six days. And every day, God says, uh, God sees that it's good, except actually for day two, uh, where it says, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it separate between water and water. So God made the firmament and separated between the waters which were beneath the firmament and the waters which were above the firmament. And, so, and it was so, God called to the firmament which were above the firmament, God called, I'm sorry, God called to the firmament heaven, and when there was evening, and when there was morning, a second day. It doesn't say, uh, Elohim kitov, that God saw that it was good. Why? And our sages teach us, because the second day was fully involved in a process of separating things, dividing things, and God doesn't see good in division, he's, God sees good in, in unity. So he needed to divide in order to define separate entities so that they could then eventually be reunified. So when we get to day three, um, twice it says, Elohim Kitov, twice it says that God saw that it was good because the third day is a day where things start being put back together and being unified again. And that is actually a, a popular expression today in Hebrew. Pamaim uh, kitov, two times good. And uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, if you greet somebody on a Tuesday, uh, a third day, right? Because the days of the week correspond to the days of creation. Uh, Sunday is Yom Rishon, the first day. Monday is Yom Sheni, the second day. Tuesday is Yom Shlishi. That's the day where uh, twice God said, that things were good, and so the expression is pamaim kitov, and oftentimes you hear a radio show, and the radio announcer will will open up, you know, it's Tuesday, pamaim kitov. It's an extra blessing. Anyway, we get to day six, and everything is just going swimmingly. God's created this beautiful, perfect world, and on day six, God creates the animals, the, the wild beasts, the, the uh, you know, the carnivores and the herbivores and the crawling things, and he's already created this, the flying birds and the, and the fish in the sea, and the Tanini Magdolim, also on uh, day five, he created the, the great lizards, the great, the giant, di the giant lizards, dinosaurs, I imagine, right? I would imagine that those are the dinosaurs. 
Um, here it's described as the great sea giants, but in Hebrew it is it is Taninim Hagdolim, mm, giant lizards. Literally, I think a I think the Greek word dinosaur I think literally means giant lizard. So, if anybody ever says, "Where do you see dinosaurs in creation in the Book of Genesis?" Well, it's right there. And then we come to sixth day and. Sixth day is about halfway through, and God said, I'm reading verse 26, and God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and they shall rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over the animal, the whole earth, and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. And here, of course, we come up to another question. It says, uh, um, it says, and I'm going to read in the Hebrew, Vayomer Elohim, Naase Adam Betzalmenu, Kidmutenu. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. What's odd there? God's speaking in the plural. God is speaking in the plural. Why would he do that? There's only one God. So I'm going to give my interpretation here, my understanding, that God is creating man, and man is is a multifaceted creature and so to create man God has to as it were imagine his own multiplicity pluralize his own unity as it were in order to create a man that over the course of history is going to be a manifold manifestation of God's will, everyone unique. In order to create this uniqueness, God had to, as it were, again, multiply his own uniqueness in order to instill it into this thing called man, Adam, right? Adam. We're going to learn later that Man is called Adam because created from the Adama, from the earth. Another aspect of the unique way that, that man was created, the, the, the process of creation of, of all the living things, the plant world and the animal world, uh, is different than the way that man was created. And in fact, the creation of man is described three different times here in these opening chapters of Genesis, and each time in a slightly different way. And so each time it gives us more insight to who we are. And really, the book of, of Genesis, creation, the book of Genesis, and, uh, and, and the Torah, and, and the entire Torah is really about man. Yes, you're going to say it's about God. It is about God. It's about man's relationship with God, God's relationship with man. But God is, is ultimately unknowable. God is ultimately beyond our grasp. But our approach to God and how close we can, we can, we can approach God is dependent on who we are. And in order to, in order to f work on and facilitate our ability to draw closer to God and to begin to understand God and understand God's creation and understand our role in God's creation, we need to learn about ourselves. And Genesis and the account of how man is created pretty much tells us the basic elements of all we need to know about who we are in order to begin the journey uh, of our own lives, to begin the journey toward an understanding of, of, of the world, an understanding of God, an understanding of what's expected of us from God. It's all here. So, he made the image, he made God, man in the image of God, and God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you all the herbage, 
yielding seed that's on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree that has seal yielding fruit, it shall be yours for food. So man was created, uh, and man is to get his sustenance by the plants, by the trees. Man is a herbivore. He is a plant-eating creature, not a meat-eating creature at this point in man's history. And then, of course, there is the Shabbat, um, the conclusion of the six days of creation, and this astonishing seventh day, which again is something that you know uh, science uh, could <laughs> could never understand, could never even approach. Uh, science, you know, for all its um, uh, for all its certainty about what fact is and what reality is can't even begin to even acknowledge this concept, this reality of the Shabbat, this concept that God, after creating the world, ceased from creation. And, and in this act of, of ceasing from creation, he infused creation with this thing called Gdusha. And that thing called Gdusha is another energy in the world akin to tov, akin to goodness. And it's what binds us. It's what binds the entire world to itself and binds us to God. It is a gravitational force of holiness that holds it all together. If it weren't for that seventh day, the six days of creation wouldn't have amounted to a, a, a hill of beans. It wouldn't have stuck together. It wouldn't have existed. It was the seventh day which brought it all home, which made it real. Then, after we're told about the seventh day, we go to chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heaven and the earth were finished in all their array. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And I'm, I'm sorry, I'm reading now the absolute about, uh, about Shabbat. I'm going to skip that. We already talked about that. Uh, verse 4. These are the products. Uh, actually, in Hebrew, it's these are the generations. Eletodot. These are the generations of heaven and earth when they were created on the day that Hashem, God, made, heaven, made earth and heaven. Okay, first of all, Hashem God, a new aspect of God has been introduced here. Until now, it was Elohim, God, which is a very, I might say, generic term for God. Elohim is the God of creation. He's the God of the natural world. And all of a sudden, we're introduced to Hashem, uh, Hashem Elohim, right, the ineffable name, Yud, K, Vav, and K in Hebrew. Hashem Elohim made, he made earth and heaven. And heaven and earth are flipped to, to, to earth and heaven here. So then, this is all leading to a second description of the creation of man. And this is essential because man, another element of man which is unique from the rest of creation is that this pipeline of communication between God and man, which is, uh, is described by the word Hashem, by the name Hashem, has been introduced. It's been revealed in the world. It was, was always part of, of God's reality. Now it's been revealed for the purpose of, of being a lifeline to man. This is our direct line. This is our hotline to Hashem. The Yudke Vavke, that aspect of Hashem's being, of Hashem's reality, of Hashem's presence in our world is, I'll use the word, the personal aspect that we can dial up and relate to and communicate with uh, on a very, very personal, unique, individual level. And that is why it's introduced here because we're learning about man, how man's being formed. God, it says here, uh, 
in verse 7, chapter 2, and Hashem, Hashem God, right? Hashem God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, and the man became a living being. So this man who was already created, really, we already learned that he was created, but now he's, we're learning that he was created on a whole other level of the rest of creation, and that his, his physical being is as physical as can be. It's from the earth. It's totally grounded. And this is maybe maybe why uh, that the 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 order of heaven and earth was flipped here to earth and heaven. Man is totally grounded. We're as low as we can be. But we have life breathed into us, into our nostrils, by a shem. We're as high as can be. We've got the low. We've got the high. And right here, this is it. This is man, and this is our challenge. Every moment of our lives is taking that low and lifting it up via that high that we got and, and making our living being, our physical living being, into something that is, that is, a, is, is what it's intended to be, which is a, a beautiful, living, spiritual being that, like Hashem, does good, brings good, improves. Lativ. Hashem saw it was good, and after man was created, I neglected to say earlier, after Hashem was created on that sixth day, it says uh, that, um, it says, and God saw all he made. I'm going back to verse, uh, to chapter 1, verse 31. And, Vayar Elohim et kol asher asa tov ma'od. Right? And God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Tov ma'od. This last day, the sixth day, got a special tov ma'od. What was so good about it? Well, there's a secret here. The word ma'od, right? Tov ma'od, which means very. Which means very. Tov ma'od. Those letters for ma'od, mem, alif, dalit, the same letters that form the word adam, alif, dalit, mem. What was so good about the sixth day? Man was so good about the sixth day. And think about that when you say the Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Vahavta b'chol avavcha uvachol nafshecha uvachol mu'odecha. And you shall love God with all your heart, avavcha, with all your soul, nafshecha uvachol mu'odecha. And it's translated usually as all your might, all your being. It's all your Adam. It's all who you are. It's all your essence. You need to love God with that. With every fiber of your being, you need to love God. Tov ma'od. We have this incredible potential that God planted in us when he created us. And then, moving right along, we have the whole incident of the tree of good and knowledge. And of course, man is told, stay away from that tree. Everything else you can eat. And then man, God says something that is astonishing. Astonishing in its peculiarity. Because he says, chapter 2, verse 18, Hashem, God said, he said in Hebrew, Lo tov hayot hayot adam levado. It's not good that man be alone. Whoa, not good? Where did this concept even come from? Everything up till now is good. Everything is good. What, how does not good come into the world? Hashem says it's not good that man's alone. What does it mean to be alone? It means to be not connected. It means to not have a partner, not to have a, 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 some, something, someone to communicate with. To not be involved to not be to not be uh you know on, on on the same wavelength with anything else man was man on everything god created a beautiful world put man in it so ate from everything but that tree man was happy man wasn't complaining man didn't say to god i'm i'm i'm, I'm lonely in fact man didn't say anything god says it's not good that man should be alone if you ask me this, this loneliness that God's expressing is God's loneliness. And how could God understand what being alone is? 
when God is everything unless God is lonely. Why should God be lonely? How is God lonely? Because God created man in order to be the, the pinnacle and the portal for bestowing God's goodness on and for receiving God's goodness and for showing God gratitude for that goodness by, in turn, bestowing goodness on creation. And so God created man, and now he did, God did such a good job that man is content. And God's lonely because God created the world so that God could have a relationship with man. So God creates a helpmeet for man. He creates a, a significant other. He creates, he creates woman. And as soon as God creates a woman, man starts talking to God. You could do with that what you will, but we're running out of time. I don't wanna, I don't wanna dwell on that right now, maybe another time. And so we know what happens next. And man uh, and, and woman, or I should say woman is, you know, dealt with, uh, she's tempted, she's dealt with very slyly by this, by this serpent. And she takes from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and bad. And she is convinced by the snake that there's nothing wrong with eating from it, that God was just telling him a story. And she eats from it and gives it to Adam, and he eats from it. And of course, we know that um, uh, the woman uh, was, had not directly heard from God that you're not supposed to eat from this. Uh, and the serpent convinced her that she could. And there's a whole teaching about this. Again, I'm not going to get into that now. But they both eat from the tree that they were told not to eat from. And um, then it says, uh, then it says, do, 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 do. Um, they hid, right? They realized that they were naked, and they sewed together a fig leaf, and they made themselves aprons. Okay, what do I mean they realized they were naked? They, what does it mean to be naked in, in this context? Uh, physically naked? Why would they be ashamed of that? They, 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 they realized that they, they, some kind of spiritual covering, some kind of, of, of power that they had before, had now been diminished. Their eyes were opened, we're told. They, can, they see division in the world. They see good and bad. It's not, it's not this unified, perfect world anymore. They've been downgraded. They've downgraded themselves, as it were. They've stepped into a lower perception of reality. And so now they're seeing things like they never saw before. And God, we're told, again, a, a fantastic, concept here, we're told that they heard the sound of Hashem, God, walking, mitalech, bagan, right? In English, I hear it says here, manifesting itself. Again, you know, it's, it's a lovely translation, but it's not the same as walking. They heard God's voice walking in the garden. What? And they were hiding, and God said an amazing thing, Ayeka, where are you? Like God doesn't know where they are. Of course God knows where they are. Where are you? And this is the first question that, 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 that God has for man. And it's, you know what? <laughs> it's the question, it's the question that we have till today. Where are you? We need to ask, where are you? Where am I? Who am I? And of course, man says to God, you know, we, we, we were naked and God says, had you know that? You ate from the fruit. And, you know, we know what transpires. Man basically, God said, Stick with me, man. Stay in my garden. Be with me. And man said, nope, I'm opting out. I want to go my way, the way of, 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 of thorns and thistles. That's how it began. We stepped into history. Here's the music. So much more to say, but I've run out of time. We'll pick it up next week. Thank you so much. Ten